so when pressure abrasion is there along with the pattern of the material then it is better to use the terminology patterned abrasion hi guys this is dr mahendran your forensic medicine and toxicology faculty welcome to the discussion of inact main 2022 forensic medicine and toxicology recall question discussion the purpose of this session as you know this is not meant to replicate the same, same wordings of those questions the objective of the discussion is to identify the core areas where the question were asked and to strengthen the concepts on it this is basically for revising the concepts on those areas in this session from forensic medicine we got significant number 11 questions from the subject and uh, if you see those questions there was question on fingerprinting it was asked in the last session as well there were questions on arsenic poisoning again frequently asked area opc poisoning always favorite for uh, the question paper setter there was a question on mechanical injuries as well even that was also asked last year sessions okay so remember the concepts will always be repeated so let us start revising those concepts by looking at these questions let us start the first question fingerprint rate starts appearing by or appear by 26 to 28 weeks 12 to 16 weeks 24 to 28 weeks 32 to 36 weeks straight factual question there is no concept behind it this is basically a factual question the answer is very simple it is 12 to 16 weeks it starts appearing by 12 to 16 weeks it gets completed by around 24 weeks so the best answer here is 12 to 16 weeks of intra uterine life it is intra uterine life fine once it is formed it is permanent it doesn't change do remember always dactylography the technique of dactylography it is superior than dna fingerprinting because even with monozygotic twins this dactylography the fingerprint will be different so that is why this is superior than dna fingerprinting if you want to differentiate monozygotic twins dactylography is the best method than your dna fingerprinting fine now let us start looking at the patterns see we have basically four patterns loops whorls arch and composite fine composite is one mixed one when there are more than uh, one pattern we uh, in the in the region we can say that this composite but the remaining three first one this is loop this is whorls fine the second one this is loop the third one that is arch when you have the spirals right we can call it as whorls this is whorl when the ridge starts from one side it goes to the top comes back to the same side we can call the test loop which can be radial loop which can also be a ulnar loop okay depending on the orientation then the third one that is called arch where in the loop the ridge will starts from one side it moves to the top moves on to the opposite side it can be a plain arch it can also be a tented arch it can be anything fine if you look at these patterns which is most common the most common is loop pattern around 65% of the general population will be having a loop pattern around 25% of the people will be having whorls pattern that is second most common and then for comes the arch pattern around 7% of the general population can have arch pattern and the least is meant for composite okay the least is composite pattern the most common is loop pattern the least common is composite fine now looking at these patterns see i told you 65% of the people the most common pattern among the general population is loop pattern then how to identify the individual person how do you know the fingerprint belongs to one particular person when the loop pa patterns are common with so many people for that we don't have to look at this pattern we need to see what is called as rich characters rich characteristics that is called minutiae right or rich characteristics we need to look at this to identify the person fine which we have discussed detail in our uh, regular lecture videos fine now the next important thing that you have to know in a, in a pattern is to identify certain terminologies the first term that you have to know is core core this is a central part of the pattern and wherein the ridge will start converging from that and you can also say this is called as inner terminus this is called as inner terminus this is core 
there is one more that is called delta that is the next term that we have to be exposed with this is called delta this can also be called as triradiate this is called delta also called a triradiate or you can also use outer terminus for this core is the inner terminus and delta is the outer terminus where the ridge starts diverging from each other right if two three ridges starts diverging from each other this point is called the delta this is delta okay so i told you what is core i told you what is delta depending on what pattern that we have in the fingerprint the number of core and delta will vary for example see this is a loop pattern wherein we will have one core and one delta normally one core and one delta this is loop pattern the second one this is whirl pattern wherein we normally have one core if we have one spiral we have one core and two delta in case if we have two spirals a variant of whirl when we have two spiral then we have two core and two delta but normally we have one core and two deltas in arch normally we don't have any core we don't have any delta fine sometimes it may be variation we have one core or one delta plus or minus fine but normally in in a case of loop we have one core one delta in a case of world we have one core two delta that is norm, normally not seen in a case of arch you can see the three pattern verse loops arch you can see in the same sequence i told you the most common is loop fine moving on to the next important uh, thing with regard to fingerprinting is what are the conditions where we get a variation in the fingerprint ridge what are the conditions where we get an alteration in the fingerprint ridge that we have to see sometimes the ridge pattern will not differ but the ridge distance inter ridge distance will get increased where we can see that it is seen in a case of acromegaly it is seen in a case of infantile paralysis infantile paralysis it is also seen in a case of rickets these are the three situations where the distance between two ridge will increase you can also remember by the mnemonic air a i r okay acromegaly infantile paralysis and rickets then there are few cases where there are few conditions where there can be atrophy of ridge it can be complete or it can be incomplete there can be a complete atrophy or there can be an incomplete atrophy partial atrophy if it is complete atrophy do remember c for c that is celiac disease in celiac disease we can find complete atrophy of the ridge in incomplete or partial atrophy of the ridge can be noted with dermatitis dermatitis okay fine now moving further there can sometimes there can be alteration of the ridges itself permanent alteration of the ridge can be noted in a case of leprosy radiation and charring fine where there can be in permanent alteration of the ridge sometimes what happens there can be alteration of the pattern alone if there is an alteration of the pattern itself right that is normally seen in case of scleroderma that is normally seen in case of scleroderma where there can be alteration of the pattern itself fine right now moving on to the next question the following test is used to identify the vaginal cells on the glans penis during the examination of an accused in a case of rape so this is for examination of rape accused precipitant test florence test lugol sidin test and toledin blue test okay fine now let us see the areas the question answer is very very simple you know it is lugol sidin test it is so simple it's one of the repeat question but let us look at the other options see precipitant test is a test this is meant to identify the species whether it is human or non human this is meant to identify the species maybe in seminal examination we can use this in relation to this discussion okay florence test yes this is used in uh, seminal test again remember florence test and barbirios test these are the two important tests that you have to know for this seminal stain examination one is barbirios another one is florence in barbirios test we get yellow needle crystals whereas in uh, florence test we get rhombic crystals brown rhombic crystals 
fine lugol's iodine test is meant to identify the vaginal epithelial cells this test is to identify the vaginal epithelial cells on the accused right why should we look at the accused because you must be remembering what is called as locard's principle of exchange whenever there is a contact between two surfaces there is an exchange of material between two surfaces so when there is a contact between the male genitalia female genitalia there is an exchange of vaginal epithelial cells from the victim onto the accused so we going to identify the vaginal epithelial cells on the accused right now what we have to do is we need to take a filter paper just smear it on the glans penis and on the filter paper that expose it to iodine vapor when you are exposing it to iodine vapor the test will be if it is positive we will find brown color discoloration we will find brown discoloration or brown color presence that will indicate it is positive it is positive when brown color is there it is positive fine this is lugol's iodine test and do remember i'll tell you another important point with regard to examination of accused remember examination of accused at the request of the police can be done as per the section 53a crpc remember 53a crpc suppose there is another relevant point with related to this that is examination of victim this is done as per section 164a crpc fine the purpose of discussing this particular point is we had questions on the victim examination multiple times in the earlier sessions so do remember examination of victim concern is mandatory okay now moving on to the next option toluidine blue test this is a test which is done in victim examination rape victim examination wherein we are going to identify the recent micro injuries this test is done to identify the recent micro injuries during the using the dye toluidine blue okay fine so this is called toluidine blue test this is again one of the repeat question right moving further so coming to the question of mechanical injuries students have given multiple versions of this question so injury was on the forearm but some students said it is looking it was looking like an abrasion a uh, few other students told me that it was looking like an eustachian cut so i have given you both the versions of it fine let us look at both the injuries identify the mechanical injuries given in the picture if the injury was like this we have multiple parallel lines multiple parallel abrasion scratch marks then it is actually a grazed abrasion fine if it is looking like this multiple linear superficial cuts cuts like this on the forearm then we should say that is eustachian cuts look at these injuries if the injury was like this this is a typical grazed abrasion multiple linear scratches over a wide area this is a typical grazed abrasion but if the injury was like this multiple cuts it was not an abrasion it was multiple superficial cuts then it has to be an eustachian cut let us look at those injuries so, so this is grazed abrasion if the injury was like this this could be grazed abrasion and if this injury was there then it has to be eustachian cuts eustachian cuts or tentative cuts we know very well grazed abrasions are usually seen with road traffic accident so we can say that manner is accidental but eustachian cuts it is suggestive of suicidal tendency so it is suggestive of suicidal tendency okay let us look at the other injury so this is again grazed abrasion we can see over a wide area this is the grazed abrasion the most common abrasion which is also called as sliding abrasion scraping abrasion we have various names of it gravel rash gravel rash then this is another injury this is bruise this is basically ectopic bruise ectopic bruise is the bruise that is present away from the site of impact because the blood migrates from one area to another area this is also termed as migratory bruise migratory bruise the commonest example of ectopic bruise is this black eye black eye okay 
Another example of this ectopic bruise we can find out that is battle sign. That was also one of the frequently repeated question. Battle sign which is suggestive of middle cranial fossa. Okay. Now this one you know this is an abrasion. What kind of abrasion? This is ligature mark is normally a pressure abrasion. Ligature mark is normally a pressure abrasion due to the pressure causing crushing of the epithelium. This is pressure abrasion. But in this picture, we can also see the pattern. So when pressure abrasion is there along with the pattern of the material, then it is better to use the terminology patterned abrasion. Okay. So this is patterned abrasion. Fine. This is another question, which was a new question for Inisate. Identify the poisonous plant having yellow flowers, yellow color flowers, seeds contained in the pricky capsule. So this is another important uh, uh, plant. You can see this is uh, this we have discussed in poisonous food. The plant is nothing but Argimone mexicana. Argimona mexicana. This is the plant. This is not Nerium odorum because in Nerium odorum, though we have a local flower that will be bell shaped and Pepavar somniferous, we have a capsule. This is uh, there is no capsule mentioned. The typical capsule which is normally given in the exam for opium plant. And this is definitely not Calotropis, which is a plant irritant. So remember, this is basically Argimona mexicana. Let's discuss something about it. Argimona mexicana, it is related to the disease epidemic dropsy. Fine. So this Argimona mexicana is normally called as the, the common name is Pila datura. Pila the Pila yellow color, right? So Pila datura or Mexi Mexican poppy. So we have various names, common names for it. But when you look at the plants, plant, almost all the plants or all the parts are toxic. But if you look at this, this is usually this poisoning is seen when the Argimon seeds oil, the seed oil, the seed oil is adulterated with the mustard oil. This seed oil, when it is adulterated with the mustard oil, we get a disease that is epidemic dropsy, epidemic dropsy. The reason is we have two important toxins here. One is sanguinarin. One is sanguinarin, another one is dihydrosanguinarin. These are the two important toxins present in this particular oil that is causing epidemic dropsy. So do remember the toxins. One is sanguinarin, another one is dihydrosanguinarin. And there are two other toxins which are associated in the plant itself. The plant will, plant will be having berberine and protop. Topic. But the important toxins are these two that is sanguinarin and dihydrosanguinarin. Just do remember these two important toxins. Fine. Now what about the toxicity? What does these toxins do? These toxins what happens is this causes increased capillary permeability. It causes increased capillary permeability which is causing plasma leak into this ECF plasma leak into the extracellular space. So when there is a lot of plasma leak into the extracellular space, we get edema. The person gets edema. When there is a lot of fluid going out of this, so the person gets hypovolemia resulting in hypotension. Hypovolemia and hypotension and hypoperfusion. That will cause stimulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Again, that will cause fluid retention. So, this is basically a vicious circle. This is basically a vicious cycle resulting in heart failure, cardiac failure. The person may die of cardiac failure because of this. Okay. So, this is the uh, simplified pathophysiology of this epidemic dropsy. The main reason is you can see the main clinical feature is the edema that you can see in the person. Okay, so this is the edema. This is epidemic dropsy. So how do you treat this disease? Remove the oil because I told you this is basically due to adulteration of this oil. Fine. Right? So this is basically we have to remove this oil from the uh, diet. Next thing we have just have to do supportive measures. We can give antioxidants like vitamin C, which will be helping the patient. Fine. Right? So do remember. High sanguinarin and dihydrosanguinarin. These are two important toxins. And uh, the plant is Argimona mexicana. 
Okay. Now moving to the next question, arsenic poisoning. In chronic arsenic poisoning, following features are present. In chronic arsenic poisoning, what are the following features present? Aldrich means line. This is basically a multiple choice questions, multiple correct answers. Aldrich means line, all the nails, raindrop pigmentation, resembling fading measles rash, mixed neuropathy, luminescent vomitus and bone marrow depression. Okay, so this is a very easy question. We have uh, got this question multiple times in the previous sessions. Let us have a discussion of this arsenic poisoning. See, arsenic, it is basically a metalloid. We know arsenic is a metalloid. We have inorganic arsenic and organic arsenic. When you look at the organic arsenic, Organic arsenic is organic arsenic. Organic form of arsenic is arsenobutane. Arsenobutane and arsenocholine. Arsenocholine. Both are, do remember, they are present in seafoods, non toxic. But inorganic arsenics are toxic. Arsenic trioxide, all these things are toxic. Okay, so these are present in the seafoods. And usually they are non-toxic. Fine. Let us look at the chronic arsenic poisoning. You know very well chronic arsenic poisoning. There is arsenicosis, acute arsenic poisoning, acute arsenic poisoning. It causes what is called as hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. The clinical feature, one of the significant clinical feature is hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. And if you remember, during postmortem findings, the stomach, we see red velvety stomach mucosa in a case of acute arsenic poison. Do remember that? We can correlate with this. Clinical feature is hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. It also causes hemolysis. It also causes hemolysis. The person will have diarrhea. The person will have fluid loss. The person can also have cardiovascular collapse. And we can also notice acute tubular necrosis in this patient. So the most important thing is hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, acute arsenic poisoning. As I told you earlier, chronic arsenic poisoning that is called arsenicosis. That is called arsenicosis, chronic arsenic poisoning. If it is due to drinking water, we know that is called hydroarsenism. Fine. Now remember, in chronic arsenic poisoning, every system is affected by arsenic. Each and every system is affected by arsenic. So, if you look at the skin, if you look at the skin, the person will have initially hypopigmentation. We call it as leukomelanosis. Then the person will have hypopigmentation, rain drop pigmentation, particularly over the trunk of the person, right, the chest and the abdomen, uh, rain drop pigmentation. And hyperkeratosis, one of the key feature of chronic arsenic poisoning. Hyperkeratosis, particularly in the palms and soles. Palmo plantar hyperkeratosis. Look at his nail. When you look at his nail, suppose this is a nail, you can see transverse white line in the nail. Leukonychia strata, mees line. Okay. These are Alrich mees line. These are Alrich mees line present in arsenic poisoning. Aldrich, maize line, present with arsenic poison, chronic arsenic poison. Not only that, it also affects the nerves. Remember friends, it causes, it causes neuropathy, but it causes sensory motor, sensory motor, polyneuropathy. That means it affects both the sensory nerves and the motor nerves. Sensory nerve involvement will be more than the motor nerve. Sensory nerve will be affected more than the motor nerve, but it affects both sensory nerve and the motor nerve. Mixed motor neuropathy, mixed neuropathy can be seen here. Then it affects the vessels. It causes peripheral spasm. Not only is peripheral spasm, it results in peripheral ischemia. When there is chronic peripheral ischemia, do remember friends, it causes peripheral gangrene. We can also notice peripheral gangrene in this patient, chronic arsenic poisoning patient. If you remember one of the previous session of AIMS, we got question on black food disease, which is nothing but the peripheral gangrene seen with chronic arsenic poisoning. Black food disease, that is another important terminology that you have to remember in chronic arsenic poisoning.
okay now apart from this it also causes bone marrow depression the person can have anemia when there is bone marrow depression the person can actually have pancytopenia as well remember arsenic in arsenic is actually neuro, neoplastic neoplasm it induces a lot of neoplasm right it is carcinogenic we can see the increased incidence of skin cancers it increases the neoplasms of skin kidney bladder liver it affects multiple organs it increases the incidence of uh, neoplasm in multiple organs bladder liver lung particularly in liver we find the increased incidence of angiosarcoma okay so in skin we can see the increased incidence of basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma so all these are due to chronic arsenic poisoning i told you every system is affected how do you diagnose it see you remember this arsenic is normally getting deposited in the bone in the hair in the nail and the skin in all these tissues it get deposited so if you can take the nail sample or hair sample you can easily find out but the more reliable one is you can you can see but the more reliable one is you can look at the urinary arsenic level when you estimate the urinary arsenic level particularly 24 hours urinary arsenic level it will be more than 50 micrograms per day when it is more than 15 micrograms per day then the we can say that the person is suffering from arsenic poisoning and we need to be very cautious when we are checking this 24 hour urine arsenic level we need to exclude we need to make sure that the person has not eaten any seafood for the past 24 hours because i told you in seafood we have arsenobutane and arsenicolin that may be there so we need to exclude the person we need to find out that the person has not eaten the seafood for the previous 24 hours okay so this is how we can diagnose what about the treatment option treatment option is very simple if it is chronic only one important uh, treatment fine it is to remove the arsenic from the source remove the exposure from the source that is the most important treatment apart from that we can do chelating agents we can do chelation chelation can be done by two things one is bal or dimer caprol bal we know very well that is british anti leucocyte dimer caprol of course we can use this dimer caprol in multiple metal most of the metallic poisoning we can use this i will tell you another important point in bal cannot be used only in few situations avoid this bal in iron poisoning and cadmium poisoning right even an organic organic mercury we cannot use this bal in these are the situations where we cannot use bal apart from that we can use bal in multiple things right and one of the important thing is arsenic bal we can be using arsenic dimer caprol this is bal it is basically an injectable form very painful so sometimes we may have to go for oral alternate that is succima right d m s a right and that is oral form we can use that as well in a case of alleged murder of a by b at a certain place on a day and time c saw b with a knife on that day remember he has not seen b stabbing a he has seen b with a knife on the scene of crime c state the same thing in the court of law this type of evidence is dash we can replace the alphabet with ram and sham okay this type of evidence is is it a direct evidence is it an indirect evidence indirect evidence is also called as corroborative evidence or is it an hearsay evidence the last option hostile witness is not in the discussion at all that is wrong clearly we can say that hostile witness see hostile witness also called as unfavorable witness who is not either telling the truth or he is not favoring the side which is called hostile witness okay which is definitely not in the option now we have direct evidence indirect evidence or esa evidence we'll discuss about that see what are the different types of evidence direct evidence which directly proves a fact the eye witness directly proves a fact b stabbed a i witness indirect evidence indirect evidence is not directly seen the crime it has got collateral facts from which you can confirm the direct evidence you have collateral facts you have seen the accused with a knife on that time which can prove that he has stabbed a okay so it has it has basically a collateral fact from which you can infer the direct evidence that is called indirect evidence or corroborative evidence finding a blood in the clothes of the accused that can be an example
Okay, we have another one that is hearsay evidence. What is hearsay evidence? Here, the person has not directly seen the crime. He has heard others telling that. When the person is telling what he has heard, then you can say that is hearsay evidence, which is not that valuable in the court of law in India. Not that reliable. Okay, so we have direct evidence and indirect evidence and hearsay evidence. We'll see that. Now look at this situation where the person B is stabbing person A with a knife. In the same scene of crime, Raj was there in the scene of crime. He has seen the stabbing of A by B. Raj is an eyewitness. He will give the direct evidence which can directly prove the fact B has stabbed A. He is an eyewitness. In case Raj came out of the scene, Ram is his friend. Raj is telling his friend Ram that I have seen B stabbing A. I have seen B stabbing A. In the same time or just before it, Ravi was another person in the scene of crime. He has seen the accused with a knife, blood stains on it. Now remember friends, Ravi has not seen B stabbing A. Ravi has seen the accused with a knife. In the scene of crime, at the same time, Ravi can act as a corroborative evidence or indirect evidence. Fine. Now, what about Ram? Ram is an hearsay evidence. He has heard that B is stabbed A. Okay. So, direct evidence, indirect evidence and hearsay evidence. Fine. Right. Now, moving further, all the following are the muscanic manifestations of OPC poisoning. One of the favorite area for examiner every time, right, very, very often that you get questions on it. Okay. Urinary incontinence, diuresis, bradycardia, midriasis, bronchoconstriction. Let us have a quick revision of OPC poisoning. So that we'll try to answer questions. Fine. OPC poisoning, organoposterous poisoning. Do remember it causes, what is the mechanism of action? The mechanism of action, it causes irreversible, it causes irreversible inhibition of acetylcholine esterase enzyme, acetylcholine esterase enzyme, right? That enzyme is irreversibly inhibited by, okay, OPC poison. If it is carbamate, that is reversible limit. That is the reason why I am stressing on that point it is irreversible inhibition by opc poisoning it is reversible inhibition by carbamate poisoning now what happens what are the clinical features you know see when there is irreversible inhibition of a uh, this particular enzyme what happens is we get cholinergic toxidrome we get cholinergic symptoms what are the cholinergic symptoms certain symptoms may be due to muscarinic stimulation certain symptoms will be due to Nicotinic stimulation. Okay, so let us have a quick revision of it. Muscarinic, do remember, I have told you the mnemonic dumbbells. Dumbbells. What is this dumbbells? D for diarrhea. D for diarrhea. Uri urinary incontinence or urinary frequency. Urinary incontinence, urinary frequency. Remember meiosis, not midriasis. Constricted pupil, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea. All the secretions will be increased. Bradycardia, bradycardia. Emesis, person will have vomiting. Person will have increased GAG motility, increased lacrimation. Sometimes we get red tears, lacrimation, salivation. I told you all the secretions are increased. So do remember the mnemonic easily dumbbells. We can remember all the features. And nicotinic features, the person initially will have fasciculations. And then later what happens, the person will have muscle paralysis. Neuromuscular paralysis, person will have muscle paralysis will be raised. And not only that, sometimes we can see pupil dilatation also. Sometimes we can see tachycardia also that is due to this ganglion stimulation. But primarily what happens, primarily what you have to know is it causes meiosis and bradycardia. Fine. Now what about the treatment option? Treatment option is very very simple. First one we have to do gastric lavage. Decontamination is important. If it is oral, we can do gastric lavage. Depending on the route of exposure we can do decontamination. Right. And the most important treatment would be atrophin. Most important treatment would be atrophin IV. We have to give atrophin 
till full atropinization complete atropinization we have to check the secretions for complete atropinization and then we can also give oxymes we can give uh, pam pridoxin we can uh, give oxymes okay oxymes and atropin they have got synergistic role but the most important antidote is atropin okay now let us look at this option let us try to solve this mcq urinary incontinence is seen yes that is a correct statement bradycardia is seen that is a correct statement midriasis is seen that is not a correct statement incorrect statement bon bronchoconstriction is seen that's a correct statement so in this answer in this question what is the correct answer midriasis will be the correct answer okay moving further so there was another variation of the same question which I got from the students. So, I thought I will share it with you as well. Most categories feature of muscarinic symptoms in OPC poisoning among the following. Okay. Respiratory symptom like salivation, respiratory symptoms. Okay. And salivation, rhinorrhea, bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, midriatic pupil, tachycardia, skeletal muscle contraction. All these things are there. The characteristic feature will be increased secretions. So, I think option would be, A would be appropriate. A 27 year old patient comes to the emergency with salivation, diarrhea, watery eyes, dysuria, what will be the first line of the management? So this is purely, this is purely cholinergic uh, syndrome, wherein we can think of two important things. One is uh, mushroom poisoning, manita muscaria or OPC poisoning. In either situation, we can see atrophin is the best option for this. Calcium gluconate, no. Glucagon, no. Plyd instead of pyridoxine, the best option is atrophin. Okay, so the appropriate answer is atrophin, which is not a feature of cocaine intoxication. Again, cocaine is one area where uh, we get uh, questions in any set multiple times. Once you got a question on the source of uh, cocaine, that is erythroxylum coca, that was an image based question. And then uh, multiple times we got a question on the effects of cocaine which is not a feature of cocaine poisoning, hypothermia, hyperthermia, tachycardia, bradycardia, constricted pupil, dilated pupil. So these are all the same question that will be asked in cocaine. So let us have a look at it. Let's have a quick revision of cocaine. Then we'll look at the options. You know, cocaine, it is obtained from erythroxylum coca, which is basically an alkaloid. We have multiple forms of cocaine. Crack, that's a smokable form smokable form of cocaine that is crack we have multiple street names for it snow white lady okay coke multiple uh, street names are there let us look at the clinical features for that we need to know what is the basic action of cocaine remember it is sympathomimetic we know why it is sympathomimetic it inhibits a reuptake of noradrenaline in the presynaptic cleft. So that is why it is sympathomimetic. Do remember this one word will tell you all the features of cocaine. Okay. You know what happens when there is sympathetic system stimulation. If what about the CNS? What is the effect of sympathetic stimulation? CNS, heart rate, blood pressure, blood vessels respiratory rate, temperature, pupils and secretions that is particularly sweating. Fine. So let us see that cocaine will stimulate the central nervous system. The person gets excited. The person gets hyper alert. The person it increases the alertness. The person gets excited. That is why person become euphoric and people abuse this. And if the stimulation is uncontrolled, the person may land up in convulsions as well. The person may land up in convulsions. You can even find delirium. You know very well cocaine is one of the delirium, right? So this causes delirium. Heart rate, it increases. The person gets tachycardia. Blood pressure increases. It causes vasoconstriction. And that is the reason why if a person is chronically abusing cocaine for a long time, the person may develop peripheral gangrene because it causes vasoconstriction. It increases respiratory rate, increases the temperature. Remember, it increases temperature hypothermia. And that is why if the, if the temperature is too much, we can find what is called as crack fever. 
fine the pupils it is dilated we don't find meiotic pupil we find midriatic pupil that is so important friends multiple time it was asked in the exam sweating of course it increases so if you look at this effects right you understand the concept behind it sympathomimetic you can answer any question from cocaine now let us try to apply this in the options cocaine tingling and numbness yes it is seen with cocaine poisoning not only cocaine you see with aconite poisoning you see with irgot okay many things you call you get tingling and numbness hypertension yes it increases blood pressure vasoconstriction it causes hypothermia yes of course it causes hypothermia it does not cause constricted pupil remember friends it causes dilated pupil so this is false option so which is not a feature of cocaine poisoning you can choose option d okay so this is the source of erythroxylum this is the source of cocaine erythroxylum coca you can see cocaine people do snorting from this okay so this is snorting which of the following causes hypertension so we have cocaine we have acute alcoholism opc poisoning acute arsenic poisoning opc poisoning does not cause hypertension sometimes it may cause hypertension due to ganglionic stimulation but usually it causes hypotension that is ruled out acute alcoholism ruled out acute arsenic poisoning that is not a key feature we get cardiovascular collapse okay fine cocaine is the best answer because just now we have seen it increases blood pressure okay so this is all about the recall questions from any set may 2022 in the subject forensic medicine toxicology do revise all these concept friends because most of the times the same concepts will be repeated in neat as well okay all the very best thank you